Welcome to Three Books with Neil Pasricha, where each chapter we uncover and discuss the three most formative books of an inspiring individual. We believe books change lives, and that's why we are the only podcast in the world by and for book lovers, writers, makers, sellers, and librarians. Thanks so much for joining us. What was the first TED Talk you ever watched? Was it Schools Kill Creativity by Ken Robinson? Power of Vulnerability by Brené Brown? Was it the TED Talk by Susan Cain or Simon Sinek or Dan Pink or Tony Robbins? I mean, there are so many to choose from. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I always think of TED.com as a little bit of an oasis, right? Like the internet is... A bit junky, don't you think? I mean, there's tons of pop-up ads and all these annoying links and there's jingles for potato chips before every YouTube video that you want to watch. But in this this annoying, clawing, kind of fish hook filled sea, all trying to jam us full of everyone trying to squeeze every last penny from our wallets, there's this thing called TED, which never feels annoying, always feels trusting. It's just a nonprofit with the CEO who takes no salary, just offering us endless, high-quality, pure content with world-changing ideas, day after day after day after day. It is a thing of beauty. It is a work of art. And TED is expanding into publishing, TEDx events, podcasts, foundations, grants. There's so much behind this, this sort of beautiful thing called TED how ideas spread, spreading ideas that matter. And you know what? There's one guy who's who's sort of behind it all, right? There's the head honcho, the head curator, the CEO, the chief puppeteer of it all. And that man is the one and only Chris Anderson. I had the pleasure of meeting Chris way back in, I want to say 2010 or 2011, after I did a TEDx talk in Toronto called The Three A's of Awesome, I was invited down to TED headquarters to do some like online chats and shoot some videos. And Chris came into the room and he said, Neil, I want to do the follow-up to your talk, The Three B's of Beautiful. We've kept in touch a little bit loosely since then over that time, but I was really excited when he accepted my invitation to come on three books. Uh, with a lot of nervousness and a lot of trepidation, I, I flew down to New York City, went to the top of a Manhattan skyscraper in a room overlooking the Hudson River, and I sat down with Chris and talked about the mind-expanding books that have shaped his life. Get ready for your brain to hurt a little bit. This one is a thinker, because in a world of shallow skimming, we're going to talk about how we get back into deep diving. In a world that is full of clutter and it's full of everyone kind of, as I said, grabbing at our attentions, how do we really make space for what matters? I am so excited to share this conversation with you and I hope you enjoy it. Now let's jump into the room at TED headquarters in New York City and sit down with Chris Anderson to unpack and discover and talk about his three most formative books. Enjoy. How are you, Neil? I'm great. I'm intimidated, I should say. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> it's my natural fidgetiness, but also here I'm sitting down with the, um, you know, you're, you're leading, as I said in my email, like, I believe the, the world's strongest thought leadership collective on the planet. And many people, including me, are, are in so in awe at what you've accomplished. Um, even though we're all stakeholders, it's just beautiful what you've put out to the world. And so I'm, uh, I'm feeling very grateful. Uh, uh, towards you and, and towards Ted, but also very uh, a little intimidated to make sure I don't totally embarrass and humiliate myself as I talk about your incredible books. That that won't happen. That's very generous. And by the way, it's Ted isn't really something that anyone did. It's um, lots of things in life have a kind of organic growth thing going on in there. They kind of they 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 want to flourish. Um, there was a lot about Ted that was the right time, right moment where um, this thing wanted to flourish. I, I'm supremely lucky to have been around at that moment and to have got to see it sort of close up, but, uh, but thank you. So when things want mm. to flourish, because this happens for some of us in different parts of our lives, whether you're in Silicon Valley with a startup with hyper growth or 
for me with my my original blog, it sort of took a life of its own. What are the custodian's responsibilities if they're sitting on something that wants to flourish? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess part of it is just to to recognize the moment. I mean, usually when when things quote want to do something, it's that's really a shorthand for saying that a bunch of things have come together and there's a moment. So in my case, in the case of Ted, it was, um, you know, it was really the, the arrival of online video changed a lot of the rules about what you could do online. And, and suddenly, um, you know, people with ideas who had only thought in the past about writing um, suddenly could actually scale the in the moment experience with other humans, human to human um, that could scale to a global audience was not really possible before, unless you happen to own a TV channel or something like that. It was not possible for ordinary people, and um, and so there was this moment where yeah. where suddenly, if you could, if you could um, put some of these things out on the line and give them a chance to go viral, uh, they would explode, and and there was there was there was a chance to sort of create a brand and show possibility and create. Really, a sort of a network effect where once people see the possibility of that, once someone's inspired by some talk that they saw online, it just it means that they look for the next one, and then more speakers start to come to you and say yeah. they've got something special. And existing speakers work harder to prepare talks, and you know you get you get these sort of wonderful cycles of liftoff. So part of it is just to to notice it. Certainly at the time when we saw this was possible. We tried to move fast. We tried to do it really well. We were really lucky that we already had an archive of quite well filmed and recorded talks that we could just simply edit a bit and put out there, and um, and then just you know celebrate the liftoff and and see to our awe how many people then wanted to to help and be be part of it. And um, it was it was it was a very exciting liftoff. That and, and really, re- yeah. And recognize the moment you did. I mean, I just walked down the hallway here. Um, we're on the tw- 12th floor, I think, mm. right? Uh, in in um, uh, this this building in, in downtown New York, um, and had the day's view count uh, for TED.com. Mm. So the number of people that have viewed a TED talk just today alone, and right. it's in the millions, you mm. know, right? Just right. just, just right. today. Um, now we're sitting in your office to give listeners just a bit of a visual tapestry. I've got a big screen TV behind me, of course, with the, the TED logo on it. Um, we're sitting on a round table with your stack of books in the middle. I see some framed portraits on the wall of, uh, I see Ken Robinson. I see Stephen Pinker. Um, uh, some Dahlia Mogahed. Dahlia Mogahed. Gave a wonderful talk. Uh, beautiful. I see a nice, very nice light, light fixtures above me and some sort of cool architectural, I don't know what they are, where, where they like look like a, a gas lamps kind of thing. It's not, it's meant to be like an Eastern, <laughs> there's a, a place of, um, of, of, of so the room is called Jirga, which is ah. the the um, um, in Afghanistan, for example, which is where I spend a lot of time. It's that was the meeting where people come together when they want to resolve a dispute, and so we have lots of disputes here. And does some of them get resolved <laughs> in this room or not? Oh, beautiful. And there's a couch. There's a couch behind you, and some nice windows looking out into the Hudson River. And you and I met in the TED head office or headquarters uh, seven years ago when I came in to do a live chat on TED.com for the three A's of awesome. And mm. I remember specifically, you walked into the room, we were in the middle of this chat, it was with some of your uh, uh, of your folks, and you said, Neil, the three A's of awesome is a hit. I'm preparing the follow-up, the three B's of beautiful, <laughs> which I, I'm still awaiting the fall. I have not, I've, I've, I've let that, that terrain be blue ocean territory for you, but that's not. Uh, that sounds like a, a very lame and awkward Punny joke, which is which would be me. But yes. <laughs> well, thank you for for welcoming me back seven years later, and uh, I'm really really excited, Chris, to talk about um, your three most formative books because um, I dug up some quotes from you about books, and and a couple of them are very fascinating. You, you said at one point, "Books have saved my life." Hmm. Um, I think that you said that in your 2002 talk on on the TED stage when you were in the process of reintroducing it to the community, um, and you also introduced. Um, uh, the TED Book Club is saying that it's a gift that you've cherished and something you'd like to pass on. You talked mm-hmm. about getting back into books after some time away. So it sounds like books have been a real um, formative thing for you in, in general, although they come to TED from a polar, <laughs> like the opposite view. Is that yeah, fair? I, I probably meant to um, save my sanity. Um, what had happened there? That was, that was um, you know, for many years I was an entrepreneur, a uh, publisher magazine publisher, I guess. And um, 
my had wrapped up my identity almost in 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 being a you know successful business leader and and seeing all the revenue and profit graphs continue to move in the right direction and most things seem to work and then came the dot com bust and everyone who was involved in technology got absolutely hammered um including um uh, my publishing business and i moved you know over 18 month period to just completely losing any belief in myself at all and lost confidence saw myself as a total loser um which i literally was <laughs> um and um and the one thing that stopped me going crazy was that i i i started to obsessively read again and i it was partly cuz um op, you know the kind of opportunities that had been there before the bust was sort of going away and there was a bit more time um and partly it was just remembering oh my goodness there's so the the world of thinkers and of ideas has moved on so far since i was at university and i i missed it all how could this happen and it just seemed so stunningly interesting and doing that reading was part of what gave me the confidence and excitement to dream about taking over ted and um you know going on that journey so so that was definitely uh a key part of it well, but, so but say but, more about that because the yeah. number one thing our listeners say on on three books is i want to read more books mm. and they want to read more books everybody wants to read more the number one excuse they give is there's not enough time or i'm too busy or i'm reading shallow shallower things i don't have time for the deep stuff mm. other than going completely bust and being a total loser and <laughs> leaning on books is there some other way that we as people can can read more. Do you have some insights on to how we can get books back into our lives more? I'm quite worried about it actually because I I do think that the internet is making it harder for us to read books. It's it's created this um almost indefinite pool of fascinating tidbits. And it's our psychology, most of our psychology is such that given the choice between the mental effort of diving into something deep versus grazing on something shallow we'll take the latter option because it's just it's just easier and you do get amazing sort of little hits from oh it's the latest mm-hmm. you know story or outrage or whatever other distraction we find online and um reading is a slower um deeper exercise that actually takes um willpower determination commitment it takes it takes brain muscle patience. to to do it it takes patience because you you have to go on this sort of um softer but longer deeper journey with someone and and when you when you do um the rewards are much greater like the actual sort of uh rewiring of your thinking can happen much more powerfully that way but physiologically a lot of people's experience my experience often is I'll sit down with a book I'll read the first chapter and I'll start feeling really sleepy. And um what is that? You know, I I genuinely think that we are in danger. You say sleepy, a lot of people say anxious. A lot of people say like I can't I can't go in, I can't go that deep. Don't got that, that time. I I guess that could that could happen as well. I genuinely think that we are educating our our brains to crave um shorter fuse satisfaction mode of absorbing information. and um and we should we should all probably worry about it a bit because uh, a lot of ideas can only be developed over a long period of time and i think it's true that some books um are too long and that actually most of the core of them could have been given in two chapters but and the reason they're big is because books have to be big otherwise they feel lightweight and you know whatever and that, so I, mean, i think i think there's a case there's a, quite an important idea of what is the right length that uh, an idea should be expressed at um some ideas should be expressed in a 10 minute ted talk but some absolutely demand the 400 page book that mm-hmm. that goes much deeper and and it's really bad if we've if we've made it harder for ourselves to go um to that deeper level so it's you know i, I just think we all have to i i think pra- it's practice you know the brain is a muscle it needs exercising we need we need to remember those those skills or we're really giving up on a lot and there's been a lot of scientific studies as, as i'm sure you know about how reading even 20 30 minutes of literature a day really does correlate with increased empathy increased compassion and all these basic positive human 
developments that we want to have in life come yeah. from immersing ourselves in oftentimes fiction, but otherwise deep, deeper stories, deeper, deeper. Right. We prefer 30 minutes of Twitter a day so that we can feel really angry at everyone, uh-huh. you know. One thing Seth Godin told me on a previous chapter of this show was we know from research people do not read on iBooks because there's too many distractions in the you know, iPad or wherever they're reading it. Whereas on Kindle, it's higher. And then of course, mm. in an analog book, it's even higher yes. because nothing will pop up in the middle of you know, right. a, a book. And so maybe, maybe awareness is the first step. I mean, we've decided to focus this show on books because honestly, Chris, I read five books a year for most of my adult life and they were always on vacation. And then three years ago, I read 50. And last year I read 100. And I wrote an article for Harvard Business Review how I did that. And it was all systematic stuff. Cancel cable, put a, install a bookshelf at the front door, commit publicly to what I'm going to read each month, like send a little note, whether that's Twitter or Goodreads, whatever, mm. just send a little note. It was, um, you know, uh, start using lending libraries in the community, like just little tiny systematic changes dramatically increased my reading rate. And I felt like a better dad, a better husband, better teacher. So, you know, if, if you're, if you're, it sounds like you're connecting with us strongly on the problem. And then we're just brainstorming together on what some of these solutions could be. So, bravo you, you know, you are the counter trend. <laughs> no, <laughs> all, pow- I'm, all power to you. No, I think no, it matters. Yeah. I really, I really do yeah. think it matters. And I, and uh, I'm sure you will motivate me by the end of this to, <laughs> to uh, up my game. Cause I've, the number of books I have read per year has definitely declined the last few years. And I, I, I hate that. Mm-hmm. And so it starts there, right? It starts with that feeling. And mm. there's some research that says that the percent digital is declining on books. Unlike art or film or television or music, the percent digital is actually declining. So analog is is making a bit of a comeback. Some people yeah. cr- crack their Kindles and don't replace them. And of course, most children start with picture books, which are analog, mm. and maybe kind of ratchet up that way. Or they want to break from screens. You know, uh, there's something here, and we're exploring it on the show. I appreciate you. Um, Audio books as well, I think, are, make a, 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 a great uh, as well. And I think that's yeah. um, that's a huge discovery and uh, and a wonderful way of escaping what, what is the the sort of um, one that you know the time constraint of like our, our, our screen time or our visual time you know that is a fixed amount of time that you you know if you if you do something it's instead of something else our audio time isn't necessarily fixed because you can do it while you are doing other things and um, and so so many people have discovered just the joy that you can now you know, while you're working or chopping the vegetables or driving or whatever it is, you can listen to something amazing, whether it's a podcast or, or an audiobook. A, a friend of mine says he actually straps his phone on his back for an audiobook while he's doing the dishes every night. And, and I know I've heard Bill Gates say how mm. important doing the dishes is for him. He puts it on 2x mm. because there is no faster speed. But he said, if there was a faster speed, I would go to it because after a few minutes, my brain adjusts and I find a "Quote unquote," read a whole book in the matter of doing the dishes over a couple of days. No, I think that's right. I think I think the fact on, that on many apps you can accelerate the speed is mm-hmm. is huge. I mean, everyone has different um, sort of types of attention, but in general, most people can absorb information faster than they can speak. The very fact that you can read faster than than you can speak is uh, is proof of that. And so, yes, for a lot of books, like I like to listen. I, I don't listen on two x usually. I listen on one point five x, but. Um, <laughs> Um, Better than zero point five, but it makes yeah, well, that's right. But, but it, make, it actually makes it um, that much more interesting. It means you can't you can't let it go. And there's something about having a speaker's voice in your head that that to me lo- lodges some of the meaning more deeply as well. So I, I, I love audiobooks. Oh, it's beautiful to hear. See, mm. I, I you know like a, a book like Brief Wonders Life of Oscar Wilde by Juno Diaz. I noticed recently that it was read in audio. I have not listened to it by Lynn Manuel Miranda. Wow! So there's yeah. a whole other reason. If he yeah. even read it or not, you'd be like, he read that book. You yeah. get this whole other view of like who's the person behind, like adding an super L- cool. Yeah, so that's really cool. So g- use your finger, Chris, if you don't mind, and point to which of these three books you want to start with. I will then give a, a 30 second overview just for the, um, the the listener on like front and back cover, which I've written out here. Um, well, let's let's start with the the newest of them. Okay. The okay. So let's start with that. Okay. So we're going to start with your first most formative book, which is Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker. The subtitle is The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. Published this year in 2018 by Viking Pangarana House. Uh, in Dewey Decimal for the librarians, you can um, file it under 190 Modern Western Philosophy. 
Bill Gates' blurb is on the cover of this book. It says, my new favorite book of all time. You can't get a better blurb than that. Um, and the overview is that Steven Pinker is born in 1954 in Montreal. He's currently a professor of psychology at Harvard. Is the New York Times bestselling author of eight books on psycholinguistics and cognitive science. Um, this book basically shatters the commonly held myth that the world is in terrible shape. In contrast, Pinker argues that life has been getting better, and he rallies through 15 different measures of human well-being, from longevity to health to declining violence to support this argument. He ascribes modern improvements to trends of liberal humanism and scientific rationality, the Enlightenment, that first took root in Europe around the 17th and 18th centuries. Publisher Weekly says, in an era of increasingly dystopian rhetoric, Pinker's sober, lucid, and meticulously researched vision of human progress is heartening and important. I ate this book like I was at a Jello buffet. I cannot wait for you to tell me your relationship with Enlightenment Now by Stephen Pinker. <laughs> I mean, I guess the first thing to say is I've I've um, I've been a huge fan of Pinker for um, at least two decades now. I think it was it was probably pretty much exactly twenty years ago um, that I've, I first read um, How the Mind Works, which which was probably his first big popular book. Um, and it smacked me across the head like a, like, like a sledgehammer. You know, I studied philosophy at o Oxford and spent, you know, two years there. Um, really, I guess, thinking about how the mind works in a sort of, from a philo philosopher's perspective. And I, I kind of loved it, was frustrated by parts of it. And uh, I've, I've always been just, just puzzled, baffled, intrigued by so many issues to do with the mind. I really felt when I, when I first read that book back in the 90s, um, How the Mind Works, I felt I learned more in a weekend than I had in my, uh, the whole two years at Oxford studying philosophy. Like wow. it, it, it was, aha, oh, I get, that. this makes sense, I see it. Um, there are two things he does in that book. One is to um, think about the mind just from a sort of um, um, what computers can do. And so that part is instructive. But the, for me, the more instructive part I had, I'd never really thought about um, evolutionary psychology and the fact that you can, so many of the, the aspects of who we are, you can understand so much more clearly if you think about our evolutionary history. Um, and so, for example, one of my philosophical riddles in Oxford, which I never really fully understood, was about ethics. You know, where does, where does conscience come from? Where, where, where does this sense that we ought to do something? How do, we, how do we make decisions about how to behave better? If you took, I was religious at the time, if you took away God, surely that meant that we would all, um, you know, just act selfishly. Why wouldn't we do anything other than that? So the notion that, no, there's this, this whole evolutionary history to human. We, we come from, you know, there are many species out there that actually do act um, in the interests of other members of, of, of the group. Um, and there are specific biological reasons why that happens. And just that was a huge aha moment that e evolution actually could have created this set of rules that kind of make you think in many circumstances, I want to help that person. Um, I, I found that intriguing and completely convincing as described. And there were just many, in every chapter, there were many other things that blew me away in that book. So I've been reading him ever since. Yeah. Um, and I've had um, all the books you've read, pretty much, yeah. pretty much all his books. Right. I, I think um, he wrote the Blank Slate. That was a very powerful argument that you know we we um, come into the world already pre-wired with a lot of um, there's a lot of structure in the in the mind already. We don't we aren't these sort of um, blank you know um, blank slates. You know that, that our parents can write on, society can write on. People um, people are wrong to think that culture is infinitely plastic and that we can just make, you know, hum humans, whatever we want them to be. And there's, there's a lot that flows from that. There is such a thing as universal human nature, et cetera. These, how, these are big ideas. How does he define mind or how do you define the word mind? I, I hear you mentioning it in titles and, and right. referencing. I just want to clip. Mind. Like, I mean, the, the mind, mind is what the brain does. Um, it's, and there are many other things you can you can say about it. I mean, there's there's a lot of mystery around what consciousness is. Like we experience the mind through being conscious, so it's it's everything we feel and experience, and we um, um, we care about that much more than we care about 
the explanation of that being what some, you know, wet gray thing, you know, is doing. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's what that, I think. That's how you think about it. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the activity of the brain that is experienced by a sentient being. Beautiful. So he yeah. is, this guy is a professor of psychology at Harvard, like kind of one of the best yeah. schools. He's a professor. He's been writing for 20 years about huge concepts, consciousness, how the mind works. He's now dropped this tome this year right. called Enlightenment Now with the greatest blurb ever on the cover. Right. Uh, lead us into this book. Uh, how does your relationship here dovetail right. with his work? So about, about 10 years ago, he made a big shift away from just the, the the kind of cognitive science, um, evolutionary psychology, and so forth that he was he was best known for to um, going even more multidisciplinary, adding in history, adding in um, statistical analysis, and he he first became you know interested in this idea of um, the decline of violence. He gave a TED talk about about this thing back in two thousand seven, and it was it was he looked at the numbers, and you know it was really surprising for anyone who's followed the news that when you actually looked at the stats, it looked like violence on average had declined both over the millennia, over the centuries, over the decades, over the years. And whether you looked at war or interpersonal violence like murder and so forth, um, violence had had declined and and you would never have guessed that, you know, from, from the news. Um, reading, yeah. And um and to me that was such an accelerating um, idea, a deeply helpful idea, and and it was completely convincing as as described. It didn't convince everyone, but uh, but it uh, turned into a book with the better angels then, of that's our right, nature. That's right. That's yeah. right. And so two years later, it became this this another tome, the better angels of our nature. So enlightenment now is is an expansion of that idea to to looking at the data on many other variables that matter to humans. I mean, he really tries to cover all of them: um, health, uh, how long we live. Um, safety like and general terrorism in there. T- terrorism, you know, the, the, the almost the, the advance of sort of progressive ideas, if you like, um, country by country. There are different places in different countries, but in every country, um, you, where you, where you can measure them, it look, you know, ideas are getting more, you know, progressive. Um, the um, and and then notions like you know literacy or you know attitudes towards um, social issues or um, to, or all manner of sort of you know quite quite surprising things he looked at and even he even takes on in the book much more uncomfortable things like the rise of inequality um, how worried should we be about that uh, the the threats of climate change uh, which is is a big huge worry for him and for others but how we should think about that and even things like the election of Donald Trump and the sort of um, the, the possible threats to you know democracy, um, growing tribalism, he, he takes those on as well. In and and I would say that the you know the um, <laughs> a, a lot of people re- react really strongly against this book for some reason. Yeah. Like he's convinced a lot of people. Yeah. Other people um, have reacted to it with almost with um, with fury. And it's it's totally intriguing to try and understand Who's, why. Who who are these people? You mean I, like I think it's publicly? quite it's, it's, yeah. pe- it's people on the left, pe- mm-hmm. people on the and, and people on the far right, both in 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 their different ways um, uh, re- react against him. I think part of um, so, for example, um, you know, someone one reason why Donald Trump got elected, arguably, was because of the argument that. Um, America is getting much worse. It's descending into this kind of chaotic hell. Every, you know, uh, people's mm-hmm. uh, jobs are going, crime is relentlessly rising, and so forth. That's why you need and, to make it great again. And make it great again. Mm-hmm. But and, and you know, as as Trump himself himself said in the election, what have you got to lose? You know, well, turns out if you look at the data, there actually is a huge amount to lose. That that, that there's definitely all manner of of, of problems, but so many things under the radar are actually far better than they were. And, you know, being reckless with the country may, may, may imperil those things. Um, and um, so, I mean, certainly people, some people on the right would, would really not, not mm-hmm. like what he's got there. Um, lots of people on the left also really hate the book. Big, I, and 
Part of it is because people find it very hard to embrace at the same time the notion that the world is getting better with the notion that there is still these awful pain points. Like there are horrific injustices in the world. If you're, if you're, main focus is on trying to persuade people to address an injustice. You may feel it doesn't help your cause to be told that, look, the world's getting better. Does that mean that I don't have to care about this stuff? Right. Well, Pink would actually say, no, it doesn't mean that at all. Um, I'm, um, that there is a huge difference between um, sort of, you know, fatalism and, um, um, and knowing that progress can happen and gaining hope from that. It's like if your whole raise if your whole reason for being is to save the world and he's like it's getting it's pretty good already you're suddenly your reason for being kind of goes away a little bit. You 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 lose a little bit of your why. Of, that, of why you get up in the morning. You're like what do you mean it's good? I'm here to help it. I'm here to fix the thing. <laughs> That's right. And so there's there's really very complex human psychology around this. Like you know one fundamental question for for any activist is what is the best way to motivate people to act? Is it just fear? Or is it some combination of fear and hope? Um, if it's just fear, then yes, you may be right to oppose anyone who says, actually, you know, there's real evidence that we're, we're kicking ass on, uh, on, on a number of issues. Um, if it's a mixture of fear and hope, then it may be a different story. And I, I, I read the book as, I mean, for me personally, here's the impact the book had on me. I, I over the last... I'm naturally um, optimistic. Um, the you know my whole uh, sort of almost approach to, to, to technology, for example, as covered by TED, has been wow, look what humans are capable of. Um, there are these um, w- we can build stuff to solve many of our problems, and uh, and indeed you know um, I look at the internet um, you know sort of you know ten years ago, twenty years ago, and say. This is so thrilling. We're connecting the world. This is, you know, it's going to be one step back with two steps forward. But by and large, we're creating this more connected world where people are going to understand each other better, be more empathetic with each other. The world's slowly getting better. And um, over the past three to five years, that that optimism really has been challenged by, you know, by by so many things. By certainly by growing inequality. Um, and then in the last few years by a sort of sense of growing tribalism that the, the actually the path towards people expanding their circle of empathy that, you know, that's actually not happening. People are starting to get angry with each other and to, um, retreat from, from that. And, um, you know, globalists are now evil in many, in many people's eyes. And this, this has felt to me like a, like a, a, a tragedy and, and really dangerous for, uh, the future of the world. Reading Pinker, I th- this book Enlightenment Now, it really um, changed my mind on a lot of this stuff. Mm-hmm. It gave me, it convinced me that I probably overreacted. That there's no question that there are terrible things that have happened in the world. There's no question that there have been some terrible unintended consequences. For example, the technologies we built, um, the you know social media has done things that uh, are the exact opposite of what many of the people who created them intended. And um, and we have to fix them, um, but they they actually like you read this book and you come out believing this actually can be fixed. Climate change is a terrible worry. It actually there are ways where we are making progress. It may not be, you know, when you look at some of the problems that have uh, that we've survived over the last fifty years, and you come in with that context. You, you you feel differently about where we are now. You, so you, you said it yourself. You know, on Twitter, you call yourself a dreamer, uh, a most days an optimist. I think right. that's your your that's bio. Right. And um, I said I, at the beginning, I read this book like I was at a Jello buffet. Like I could not put it down. I stayed up late at night with my little headlight on my forehead. Uh, my wife was fast asleep. Just I couldn't because I could, I was so addicted to how good this book made me feel. Um, there's a sense of wonder in this book uh, and awe mm. at the world. Um, you know, how do you how do you bring that out in the world more? Okay, like not everybody's going to be able to read this book. What else can we do to bring out wonder in our kids and our schools? You have a fantastic viewpoint. How do you fill the world with more of those dreams and optimism and the wonder that a book like this really is, is really kind of offering? I mean, part of it is just to remember that um, 
the media that we're exposed to is being driven by a very peculiar set of um, drivers of, 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 of algorithms now. Um, we, the, the name of the game is to attract attention. And it turns out that there are these human cognitive flaws that we are, we are just as drivers slow down when there's a horrific accident by the side of the road, we pay attention to the dramatic and to the angry and to the, you know, we, we would much rather watch someone who was absolutely convinced and shoutingly uh, strident about a topic than we would about someone who's calmly reasoning something. Um, you can measure that. That is why channels that are based on angry opinion out, you know, attract bigger Fit ratings. And leads. Yeah, exactly. And um, so um, the unintended consequence of that is that we get, um, we, we get wrapped up with a false view of the world. So, so part of the, part of the story is to, in a disciplined way, build time to come away from that mm -hmm. and to look at what else is, is happening. And, there are all manner of absolutely awesome things happening in the world. Human creativity has never been more extraordinary. You know, the fact, when, the fact that um, people learn from each other, the fact that we have all these um, technologies and other means for being creative now, you know, there, there is absolutely astonishing um, creativity in, in world of arts, of culture, um, that gives, gives, you a lot of hope for the future. Nature itself, the more we discover about it, the more awesome it seems. I love the fact that um, the BBC series Blue Planet 2, which is about the ocean, um, but it's people, you know, scientists and um, videographers have discovered new ways of recording the extraordinariness of what is happening under there. It became the most mm -hmm. viewed and talked about television series yeah. in, in Britain. And Planet Earth too, right? Planet Earth yeah. bef uh, yeah. before that. But the fact that that can happen, you know, that, that yeah. gives you a, lo um, a lot of hope. So it's, it's part of it is literally just change the subject and, uh, and, and think about something else. And part of it is pull the camera back, actually look at the data. Like I, I, I think, you know, the, the journalism itself needs, badly needs a, a new set of disciplines, which is to always in every story to play, to do, take, to take some kind of responsibility for looking at the overall context in which a story is told. Because if the only job of journalism is to ask the question, what is the most dramatic thing that happened in the last four hours? That is always going to be a certain type of story and, mm -hmm. it, and, it, and it ends up building up a, a, a false worldview. I mean, my phone right now has zero social media apps, zero news apps, and zero bookmark news websites at all. And some people say to me, oh, how can you be so unplugged from what's going on? <laughs> but it's the only way I can read so many books and and have more deep conversations. So it's a, it's a trade-off that I, unfortunately, when ISIS uh, became a big word, I asked, I was like, what is ISIS? People right. are like, have you not been reading the news for a year? I'm like, Correct. I have not been reading the news for a year. And so I didn't know what ISIS was. And it felt horrible. It felt embarrassing at first. But in exchange, of course, you pick up the basics and then you right. keep moving. I don't know if you espouse like a news fast mentality. Some people do. Tim Ferriss is famous for saying he gets all his news from just like the headlines on the newspaper boxes. Um, do, you, do you go as extreme as that? Or, you know, TED.com has got no news on it. <laughs> no, that's right. Um, no, I don't, I don't think I'm as enlightened as you, Neil. I, I do look at the news every morning, and I and I kind of um, sometimes tut tut to myself at um, you know at what we're choosing to highlight. Um, but uh, but no, I'm I'm hugely. It's, it's funny, you know. One one very simple reason that content on TED is is different from what's in the news is nothing to do with anything than the fact that. We happen once a year. They're like the main TED conference happens once a year. So people aren't coming to say what happened in the last four hours. They're coming to say what is of significance right now for the year ahead, for the years ahead. Here's and the just, summary of my 20 years of research. So, 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 so literally just <laughs> yeah. the shifting of time scale makes a difference. And, and in a way, that's that's part of what this book is doing. It's saying, okay, 
this will tell you nothing about whether something horrible will happen in the next 24 hours. But if you look at the last five years, 10 years, 100 years, 200 years, it's unbelievable what this what this graph looks like, you know. And um, I don't know. It's just it, it's beautiful. Th- there's a role in life to pay attention to that. It's a beautiful thing. You know, uh, I know you're a big fan of Tim Urban, um, famous for his 25 million view procrastination TED Talk, but also the blogger behind Wait But Why. Um, he says, the biggest thing I did differently was challenge the assumption that short is important with these 30,000 word blog posts at a depth and breath that no one would imagine would attract actual readership. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's incredibly impressive and I'm sitting here feeling hugely guilty right now because Ted stands for in many ways, the shortening of lectures from, um, you know, not 45 minutes, not an hour, um, but 18 minutes or, or less. And we've been criticized for that probably with some justification in some cases, except that what we would say, we, we you know, we, it, everything in life is what you compare it to. If you compare us to the perfect 45 minute lecture, for God's sake, don't watch TED Talk, watch the 45 minute lecture if you're willing to. Um, we're trying to stake a claim against the two minute kitten video, mm-hmm. you know, which is so adorable and you really want to click on that. But if instead you were to listen to someone for 18 minutes who's really carefully prepared how to, you know, stake out an idea in that period, you might discover one thing uh, and why it matters in an accessible way. But, but, so, so th- this question about yeah. length and, uh, you know, it does, it does really matter how we, um, you know, what is the natural, the right length to express a particular uh, idea? Yeah, it's a big deal. And, and you, I heard also the word accessibility baked into what you just said. So, um, you know, how do you disseminate high quality stuff in a way that's accessible. By the way, when I when you told me to read Enlightenment Now, I was not happy because I was like, this is so big, this book is almost 600 pages. It's thick and it arrived in my house. But I opened the book and I couldn't stop because it's so mm. well, it's so beautifully written. You get right. taken on a journey and then you feel you feel proud. It's like building a shelf. You're like, I'm good at the end of it because mm. I, I invested the time. So yeah, it's an interesting dynamic between accessibility and quality. But, mm. but thank you for exploring that with me. Um, at the front of uh, Enlightenment Now, by the way, when you open the book, right uh, on the first page before before we even get into the table of contents, there's a quote, as many mm. books begin with a quote. This one says, everything that is not forbidden by laws of nature is achievable given the right knowledge. And mm. it's attributed to David Deutsch. Deutsch. There you go. Okay. Absolutely. That is Bingo. the segue to your second book, if you don't <laughs> mind me transitioning that way, mm. to The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch. The subtitle is Explanations That Transform the World. This book was published in 2011 by Penguin Publishing, filed under Dewey Decimal in 530.01, which is, by the way, where physics and philosophy and theory sits. This is equal parts physics and philosophy. It's a 500-pager again. Uh, But Deutsch, you read big books uh, (laughs) when (laughs) when you read them, as you said. Uh, Deutsch argues there are no theoretical limits of human knowledge. He gives the reader a tour of the Enlightenment, quantum mechanics, the multiverse, creativity, artificial intelligence, and the concept of mathematical infinity. David Deutsch is an Israeli-born, Cambridge and Oxford-educated physicist at the University of Oxford and a visiting professor in the Department of Atomic and Laser Physics at the Center for Quantum Computation which, by the way, is a field he came up with. <laughs> Tell us about your relationship with The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch. Yes, yeah, so, so David Deutsch is, a, I think, another of the world's great minds, truly. Um, he, as a parenthetical thing, um, is probably one of the reasons why I had the confidence to, um, to, to take over Ted and go in that, in that direction. Uh, because in, in, in a prior book, um, Called the, I think the structure of reality. He talked. He just talked about how um, um, all knowledge is connected. This is a big theme of his. That that one of the things that the world has missed is that you know we tell all our kids or you know to go go deep. You know you've got to specialize in one thing, get good at one thing, and um, and most of science and the academic world is is based on that idea that you have all these sort of separate experts who go deep. And he said that's great, but what that misses is that. Um, to really understand something, you need to know the context of it. You need to know how it connects with, how your knowledge connects with other people's and how the pieces fit together. And, um, and you know, he was sort of mourning the fact that, you know, since Da Vinci, you know, we'd had very few sort of broad thinking people who'd specialized in connecting the dots. Um, 
So it was that that really said, wow, so TED, TED which is fundamentally multidisciplinary, it's all about bringing knowledge from, you know, um, making knowledge from different fields accessible to people in other fields to, to break down silos. That, that made that seem like not just a sort of quirky thing, but actually quite an a, quite a important, significant thing and, uh, and something that would actually never go out of fashion because the more, the deeper knowledge gets, the more you have the need for that kind of, um, you know, connecting. And so this, this book, Beginning of Infinity, is, is, um, is an unbelievable um, demonstration of that skill and practice of uh, connecting dots across multiple areas of, of knowledge. Uh, David Deutsch is, is, um, is a physicist and mathematician. Um, he's, he, but with this incredibly fertile mind that, that um, had, you know, he's, he's thought so much about um, philosophy, about ethics, and about, as, as you discover in this book, you know, many, many other topics. So the structure of the book is that there's, you know, there's topics about things like sustainability or optimism or political decision making, um, as well as more technical things like, you know, the mathematics of infinity. The multiverse. The multiverse. Just like, like <laughs> thrown in there. Like with things, the, there's a chapter called the multiverse followed by a chapter called why are flowers beautiful? Right. So aesthetics, there, there you yeah. go. And it's, and, and it seems, and I would say this is, this is a book which in parts is really difficult. There are definitely two or three chapters in there that I do not understand uh, at all. Um, or just, far fewer I just have than a, me. I, I couldn't understand uh, probably half <laughs> I just had a few glimpses at them. But but the, the essence of the to- of the book is this. It's that um, knowledge really matters. You know, there's this, there's this deep question that people worry about and are right to worry about, which is, you know, who, who are we? Who are we as, as humans? What What's our role in the world? Are we just um, another animal with this weird um, evolutionary quirk of being able to, you know, we've developed language and so we can talk to each other and, you know, we've learned to build tools and all these other things. But, you know, every every animal has their speciality. The elephant has its incredible trunk and ants have this extraordinary social organization. You know, we're just another species. Deutsch, Deutsch is answer to that is a surprising is a surprisingly confident no we we actually are special and the reason we're special is that we have incubated knowledge to a point where it can lift off um we um i mean his, his arguments you know talk about the special the, the um and the importance for example having men, invented a turing machine which is a universal computer that can in principle um, expand knowledge, expand answers to questions in, indefinitely in any direction. In principle, there is nothing that we can't understand. Um, and the, like, he gives he gives really incredible examples in there. So the one example I love is you can you can see um, the power of saying that knowledge has universal reach it can it can scale to the level of the universe by for example say noting that all the planets in the universe can be divided into two categories this is his example those that can shoot down an incoming asteroid and those that can't um (laughs) those that can have knowledge like some species on that planet discovered knowledge and discovered it to the point where it could um organized matter to the extent of being able to repel uh, uh, an, in, an invading force that might blow up the planet. Um, and he, he... And we got that. We got that. Well, it's we amazing that. that we have that. So just, it's just a pause for a second. Like, how many people even know that we have that ability? That's crazy. We, we it's not, not just a Bruce Willis movie. We may not quite have it yet, but, but yeah, so yeah, within years, real real soon now. And that in principle, from where we are, um, our species or a successor species or a technology that we've created could literally fan out from here and colonize the galaxy, for example. We could create self-replicating robots that, that travel across the galaxy. And so, so here is a life form that um, can reach out indefinitely. And for someone who's, whose mission, someone like me, who's, you know, the mission of TED is ideas we're spreading. It's like, we want to, I want to believe that ideas really matter. And um, and this is like a, a roadmap to saying, mm-hmm. oh, you don't understand how much they matter. They matter so much more than you even know. Um, I, ideas, so, so you take, you know, so, you know, 
Um, Aristotle, Mm -hmm. you know, dreams up some idea. If he could know that 2,000 years later, people people are still um, quoting him Mm -hmm. um, with awe, um, wow, you know, that idea outlived him, but our ideas today might might even outlive us. You know, we're already putting them into computers. Um, The idea of playing Go really well, you know, we we planted that in a computer and the computer further developed it. Ideas have, uh, they can extend indefinitely. And I, I find that a little bit terrifying, but mainly just awesome. It's amazing. He talks about like, you know, how many people died of, I don't know if it was typhoid he mentioned in the book or in sight of a stove that could have boiled water that could have saved their life or, you know, in sight of old bread that could have been penicillin. No, they did not die of natural causes at age 30. They just did not have the knowledge yet to solve that problem. And he intimates yeah, that all that's right. That all problems are solvable by knowledge. It's not an if, it's a when. You might just happen to be alive at the wrong time, but any problem you can think of, including death itself and where we live and all, it's just the knowledge is coming and, and you know, here's how to, here's a tour of it and behold, right. it's a mind blowing book to think about that. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And, and, um, and linked to that, he has a beautiful definition of, of um, optimism, for example, which is optimism is not a feeling of hope. Um, as we sometimes talk about it, optimism is just the belief that with knowledge, you can solve a problem, that problems are solvable. Um, the only exception to that would be a problem which is literally um, could only be solved by violating the laws of physics or something like that. Then no, that can't be solvable. But basically any problem um, compatible with the laws of physics can can ultimately be be solved. And, you know, you see, you actually see that in some people, like you see someone like an Elon Musk, you yeah. know, who, who kind of has that mindset of, um, yeah, r- why can't you make rockets one fiftieth as expensive? Well, you could, it's just a problem that needs to be solved. The laws of physics don't stop you doing that. It's just our inability to imagine reusable rockets that stops that. And so you, you see a few minds who sort of adopt that mindset as being, they are you know, the, the fundamental sort of optimists who are driving progress, you, you could argue. Uh, Elon, I don't think feels much pleasure or hope in that. It's, 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 it's a, just a belief that these things can be solved. It's like there was no new car company in the States for 90 years since Chrysler came around until Tesla, you know, but he's just like, you know, it's time for, yeah. it's not, it's, and, and, I, and by the way, as you did that, I dug up page 212 here, the principle of optimism, which I flagged, all evils are caused by insufficient knowledge. What an go. interesting definition of optimism. All evils <laughs> are caused by insufficient knowledge. And some people would push back on that and say, but wait a sec, you know, what about a clever devil? Like, like the people, there are many people who have more knowledge can do more evil uh, with that. Um, but, but I guess not if they, if they knew the bigger picture, like the more, if you know the bigger picture, you know that, um, you know, that suffering is not uh, a good thing that, that not, you know, that you can, you can, I think Deutsch would argue that you can, take a path from, from knowledge to um, why, we, why we should actually make the world better, not just suit our own ends. Anyway. No, 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 don't. Any, I love mm. this stuff. By the way, you have a quote um, where you said, if I'm getting it right, I think it's from a Telegraph article. You said, thinkers, academics, scientists should be the people society regards as celebrities. David Deutsch is clearly a thinker, academic, and scientist. But if I look at the top five most followed people on Twitter... They are Katy Perry, Justin Bieber, Barack Obama at number three, Rihanna, and Taylor Swift. So what can we do to make that vision you have of thinkers, academics, and scientists being celebrities? What, what do we do? I mean, I see people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, there's a, there's a celebrity yeah. scientist, but how and why, how do we get those, how does that happen? Talk me through how that works. I mean, I don't know. It probably happens, <clears throat> probably happens slowly. Um, and there's no, there's no reason why humans can't spend the majority of their time doing things other than examining hard ideas. Yeah. That, that, that's, you look know, at like, all music. No, <clears throat> look at all music. Look at, look at what I spend my own time doing. I don't spend my, all my time reading um, people like David Deutsch. So it's, it's, um, you know, there's no, I don't think there's any need to, to, um, sort of frown on lots of okay. That's time, a good, that's, delighting other that's people. That's helpful because I was feeling guilty <clears throat> about who I was following on Twitter for a second. <laughs> don't, 
<laughs> yeah, we don't have to worry about that. But 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 um, um, we should be spending some time celebrating the great thinkers. Um, ab- absolutely, and and part of, um, I guess, part of what we see as Ted's role is to try to help them find an expression of their vision, of their dreams, of their thinking, of their ideas, that more people can have that sparky moment of inspiration. Ah, oh, I get that. That's beautiful. And, uh, and you know, think more of them. There are definitely, there are a few people who've given talks who have discovered whole mm-hmm. new audiences who are just, who are just so excited and moved by the fact that of, of their work and their understanding of what they've said. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I like that. It's never going to rival the biggest no, but celebrities think about out there. It, but I, I hadn't heard of Ken <clears throat> Robinson or Susan Cain or Brené Brown. My introduction was through their TED Talk originally. Right. And then you get into their book and you get maybe see them speak live and, and it, it deepens. But the introduction is this accessible 18-minute summary of, of, of things that they've learned of their life in a beautiful, succinct way. So that's... It's a, it's a great way to, to do it. So let's transition to your, your third and final most formative book here, which is The Blue Sweater, Bridging the Gap Between Rich and Poor in an Interconnected World by Jacqueline Novogratz. No, no, the, Jaff- the, the Jacqueline Novogratz. The Jacqueline Novogratz, your significant other. People, by the way, are going to be cringing at this point. <laughs> Wait, he picked a book that was written by his wife that is so... That is so out of the spirit of this whole show. It's such a conflict of interest. <laughs> it's outrageous. And so what I want to say to those people is this really is <laughs> one of the best books I've ever read. And it's it's actually changed a lot how I think about the world and um, so, certainly who I am. So I 100% stand defend the choice of this book and and I hope to get a chance to tell you why. Yeah, no, absolutely. By the way, when Seth Godin picked Lynchpin as one of his three most formative books, his own his own book, he said, he said, <laughs> he said, uh, I know people will look at this poorly, but you said formative. And I got to tell you, the 20 years I spent thinking about this book and the 100 times I read through it through the edits really did form and fundamentally change my thinking and here's why clearly mm. a formative book. And, and you and I talked about this before, how this really is formative. So let me just say quickly, this book was published in 2009. This is The Blue Sweater, 2009 by Rodale. It's a file 339.46 in Dewey Decimal. That's the poverty within macroeconomics uh, class. Uh, Jacqueline left a career in international banking to spend her life on a quest to understand global poverty and find powerful new ways of tackling it. It all started with a blue sweater. She gave away to Goodwill in ninth grade, and 11 years later, while running in Rwanda, spotted a young boy wearing it with her name still in the tag. The sweater helped her realize we're all connected, and this book chronicles her journey from young idealist to founder and CEO of Acumen Fund, uh, a large nonprofit VC firm for the poor that invests in sustainable enterprise. I could go on and on talking about the amazing amounts of awards, fellowships, boards, Entrepreneur of the Year awards that Jacqueline has won. But rather, I'll just transition over to you, Chris, and tell us about your relationship with the blue sweater. <laughs> so, um, hmm. so let me tell you something else about about me that's probably relevant to this. I mean, I'm you know I grew up in Pakistan, India, Afghanistan until um, I was like 14 years old. Um, my parents were missionaries, um, and my uh, identity, I guess, has always been as a as a as a global soul. Um, and as someone who, who who wanted to find purpose beyond myself, um, I don't today uh, share the sort of born again Christianity that I grew up with. Um, but um, you know, but the the dream of of trying to find you know trying to do something for the the, the world beyond myself has has unfortunately stuck. Fortunately, or unfortunately, has always stuck there. And um, and I spent. Um, a lot of my life trying to figure out what is what is the best thing to do with that. For years, I was an entrepreneur and um, hoping one day to sort of put money into a foundation and do something. When I was able to do that, I started asking this question of, you know, how do you make change the most effectively? Um, you know, how, how do you amplify human intention, et cetera, et cetera? So I met this woman, Jacqueline Novogratz. She actually gave um, a talk at the at the first TED I put on in 2003. Um, 
And um, um, I was just astonished by her. Her way of making change was to leverage the power of entrepreneurship. Um, entrepreneurs, people with this sort of unshakable determination to make a new future. Usually we think about them in a business context of they're going to build a company um, and uh, maybe make a fortune. But most entrepreneurs don't start thinking about they're going to make a fortune. They think about, here's a problem in the world I'm going to fix and, um, um, and I'm going to attract people and they're going to come along with me on this journey and we're going to build a company. It's going to be awesome. Um, she looked for entrepreneurs who wanted to do all of that, but were operating, the problems they were trying to solve were problems for the world's poorest, most vulnerable people. And it turns out that to build companies to serve those people is, um, is supremely hard to do because um, their customers have no money. Um, they often live at the end of, in villages, at the end of long dusty roads, almost impossible to market to, to distribute to, et cetera. It's just like if you're going to pick a business model, really hard to build companies in that space, which is why she developed this, this model of sort of patient capital. It's essentially philanthropic donations um, that were channeled into these companies and where the entrepreneurs were given permission to take longer than the market would allow them to build something and generate a return. Uh, but nonetheless, the expectation I hope was that eventually they would build a viable company so that it could sustain and grow and so forth. And in many cases, you know, that they, they, they um, created companies that ended up reaching millions and millions of, of people. So her story, how she got to that point is described in the, the blue sweater and it's, 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 um, I mean, it's, it's more, it's more than a soulmate. Like she, she, she not, she not only had the belief of trying to build a life where you're, you know, you're trying to do something for the world, but was just so much more committed to it, so much more, uh, charismatic about it, uh, than I was. I, I just, I, I couldn't believe this woman. And, and, um, the, the story is moving, you know, she, she, um, Describes it honestly, you know, she she sort of, after being a banker, she jetted mm -hmm. off to Africa thinking she was going to hopefully change the world in some way, you know, fell on her face. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of an embarrassing disaster. It's a funny quote. It's like, uh, I found that the people in Africa didn't want to be saved or something like that. <laughs> a quote like that. <laughs> Indeed. And, um, and and the honesty with which she tells the story is, is, is compelling. But, um, you know, for anyone... So, so this is couldn't be a more different space, right? Than the sort of Steve Pinkers and the uh, David Deutsches in many ways. Those are those are conceptual, uh, in some ways philosophical type type books. Um, this is this is just a very human story that will appeal to anyone who cares about making a difference in the world. What does it actually take? You know, the world is so complicated. The traditional sort of do-goodery type ideas through charity, often in practice don't work. And a lot of the book is, of the Blue Sweater talks about, you know, these sort of schemes that, you know, sound like a great idea, but end up having unintended consequences that just create dependency instead of giving people dignity. And, and um, you know, by the, the shift to thinking of uh, the poor as potential customers and the healthiness of that transaction where you're not, you're not, embarrassing them by, by, you know, um, making them dependent on you. You're giving them a chance to dig themselves out of their poverty by offering fairly priced products that meet a real need. Um, just that, that journey I, I found unbelievably inspiring and this sort of beautiful mix of head and heart, really smart, but really deeply sort of soulful and spiritual, which is why I fell in love with her and uh, we ended up getting married. That was a whole other journey in itself. She but took I, a lot of persuading. But, but I see so much. <laughs> I see so much, Chris, like in the last minute, just listening to you talk about her, your eyes have have moistened, your, your body language is animated. You have so much love for the story, the passion, the, the work itself, the woman behind it. I just saw you, I just felt you light, open up and light up. You, you, you have a con deep connectedness with this work. No, it's, it's, but, it's true. And I think, I think in terms of like, look, if you ask the question, I mean, I, if you ask the question, how do you make a difference in the world, right? By say, you've got money to spend. How do you make a difference in the world? How do you, you know, there's only 
so many answers to that. Some people, like you can, you, how do you get leverage? How do you get good value for that money? You can definitely do it through certain types of technology. You can definitely do it through certain types of education. If you teach people something, you're giving them skills, you're empowering them. You can do it through certain types of design. Um, but, you know, Jacqueline's answer to that question of investing in system change um, and, and, and in building these really hard to build companies that will, so you're tapping into the power of the market, but in a way that is very sensitive to the risks of capitalism. It says capitalism itself doesn't often get you there. It, it can be toxic. Um, how do you use the power of capitalism and change the world that way? You know, she, she um, I, I think she's really one of the, of the great world changes out there. And I, and I'm, I think I'm being objective in saying no, that. I think it's clear. I mean, no, no, just, I mean, I, like I said, I could have gone on with an endless list of, of awards and, and nominations. The work she's done is, is really, truly astounding. I'm ashamed to say I didn't know um, much about it until until I went through this book. But it seems to me, Chris, that you and your wife have very interconnected work. I, I noticed with your recent launch of, of the Audacious Project, which is incredible, your I believe you call it the IPO for nonprofits uh, as a part of a TED initiative. You mentioned your relationship with Jacqueline and the conversations with her right right in the announcement. So maybe it's my imagination, but I see more and more of this these days. I see Jack and Susie Welch. I see Bill and Melinda Gates. I see these couples working together as sort of powerhouses for people like me who are married and mm. think of my wife. My wife is an elementary school teacher, mm. uh, but we're very passionate, as, as you can imagine, mm. hours of discussion each night, sharing ideas mm. and stories from our worlds. Um, can you comment a little bit to help us? How do you work with a, a spouse? Where do you find balance on what to keep separate, what to put together? Uh, for those of us who are in relationships and are navigating this world where we get to do so many things together and separate, what advice do you have for us on how we align those things? And, and what does that look like in the household? I mean, hmm. to the extent you're comfortable sharing, I'd hmm. love for you to just open that up for us um, and, hmm. and for us a bit. I mean, I, th I think every couple is is different and so you know I'd, I'd be really hesitant to try and offer you know guidelines that anyone could or should use so once the hesitation is um, gone now tell us what to do <laughs> <laughs> i mainly view myself as just really lucky like I, I think i think um it's i i think most couples probably shouldn't work together like i, I really think it's um and in fact we we don't work together on that many things we share we learn from each other we encourage each other um but we have different sort of domains of of work and why should um it? because 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 a lot of people who get stuff done are, are quite controlling i'm a i'm a controlling person so is jacqueline and and um if you're not careful you will uh disagree and fall out and whatever so it's, it's like trying to find the right space between um collaborating and um, and owning um, a piece of of what you do probably matters and um, while empowering each other while, while, while empowering and, and being and sort of um, um, learning from each other so so look if, if you can if if you are lucky enough to have a partner who deeply shares your values who you respect I mean that that, that, that is such uh, such a gift to um, be able to, at the, like, at the deepest level, believe in each other. Um, that that matters for a lot, and I know that not everyone has that. And there are many other ways to make a, a great relationship. You know, you can have great relationships that are based on playing really well together, sharing a lot of interests, having sharing a lot of friends. But there's no one way to do it. But wow, if you if you can find someone where there's just that real deep deep belief and respect and shared values and feeling that you're sort of on a on a shared journey where every day you feel like you can there's something that you can um just feel proud of in the other that that's that's a real gift i, Matt, I, feel, I feel super lucky that does feel super lucky i remember one of the first fights last thing i had was like a couple, few months into our uh relationship i gave her some card that i'd written us about like you complete me it's two hearts beating as one like i i feel like i found my other half and she was like what is this so she's like <laughs> No, I totally disagree with this philosophically. It's two people making each other better individuals. 
you know, it's two people looking out in the same way. And she had, she was much more articulate than what I'm saying right now. So she's listening, she's going to listen to this. <laughs> but, but it was like a real big mind shift to me to think the way you're just describing as, as yeah. our work is supporting each other from the base while, while letting each other shine. Yes. Yeah. The most, um, the most important vow I gave to her when I, when we got married was I, I promise I will not hold you back. And, um, and I think I've, I think I've stuck with that. <laughs> the fact that she's in a different country most of the time for me is probably evidence of that. Um, but yes, I, I don't believe in the idea of, love of, of people I getting married and becoming not. one. I, I don't believe in that. I think that's a, that's a, um, in some Christian traditions, that's the sort of the, the model. Uh, I think that's a dangerous model. I, I, I think it's better to, I think your wife had it right. <laughs> As do I. Uh, I, I. But it took me some time to figure that out because I hear I am listening to the U2 songs growing up, you know, two hearts beat as one, yeah. all this stuff. Why is that the most important vow? I promise I will not hold you back. I love it. I wrote it down as you were saying it. I promise I will not hold you back. What? what where did that come from? Um, because she is such a force of nature, um, I think all her life she was frightened about getting married. And one reason to be frightened about it is that can create expectations on you to, to sort of slow down and be there for the other. And especially men, I think, especially traditionally have mm. demanded that of their wives. Um, that would be crazy in her case, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. for, for, for her and for the world to, to sort of uh, do anything other than to encourage her to continue to spread her wings and fly. So that's been my my task number one. Well, you know, for four years, I had a 10-year career at Walmart, Chris, and for four of those years, I worked directly for David Cheesewright, who mm. became the CEO of Walmart International. And I was always astounded because when I go down to Bentonville, I noticed that most of the executive's partners, male or female, did not work. Their, mm. their husband or wife is making a tremendous amount of money and having a huge all-encompassing job. So they not, I don't know if I could say this fairly or not, but they were in more of a supportive role, okay? But with Dave, his wife, Claire, I know she was, she was the head of a, an executive coaching branch within, within a, a big prominent company. She was speaking to world uh, and corporate leaders at all times. And never once did they have that feeling. And I spoke to Dave recently about his retirement at a very young age, age 55 uh, at Walmart International. He said, Claire's been supporting my career for a very long time. I'm really excited to start you know, tilt, tilt more into hers mm. while having at the same time. I was so respected that, but it was very rare in the corporate mm. world that I saw. It's true. Mm -hmm. It's a shame. It's a shame. We should fix that. Uh, we should <laughs> fix that. Um, um, you know, mm. there's two or three big themes I just want to get to real quick before we close things up, Chris. You've been very generous with your time. What is that scope? You have, there's so much scope in all these books. I mean, we're talking about world poverty. We're talking about enlightenment, the, how people mm. think. Um, you constantly encourage people to dream big and you call yourself a dreamer. You see a lot of dreamers up close. Uh, why is developing this big scope thinking important if it is? And, and how do we in our children hmm. and in our, in the people, how do we nurture that? W where does this come from? Not everybody has this. I certainly don't think I do at all times. How do you get it? I mean, I think I see this as, humanity's single most surprising superpower and and probably the key to so much of what's happened in the world really to to the fact that we have a modern world at all is the fact that we can build a mental model of the world and then play with it you know and reshape it um is astonishing i don't no one i think no other species can can do it this way we have different names for this you know imagination design invention, innovation, uh, vision for the future, um, entrepreneurship, like all these, all these, all these things are essentially the repatterning of the future to something which you can think about and go, you know what, that, that thing doesn't exist, but it could, we could make that thing. And so that's amazing. Then the fact that we can communicate that to other people and say, let me tell you about this repatterning I've done. You know, let me tell you about this picture of the future. It's going to be great. Come along, let's do it. And so the fact that you can you can get other people excited and that they will then maybe collaborate to make this thing. That is really the only way that change actually happens. And um, and I think you know. So, so I mean, I think without without dreaming, you know, we're, we're kind of destined to a very mundane and drab 
world. And I think that we're at the point now, I mean, you could, you could have maybe have imagined a world at one point where it was just fine. Everyone lived in a village forever and it was about community life and that was it. I, the, the world's changing so fast now that probably the only way for us to even survive is to be constantly dreaming about how to tackle the things that are ugly and uh, to, to imagine things that could be beautiful. And so, I don't know, that's, I, that's why I love this idea. It's not dreaming in the sense of yeah. absent-mindedness. It's dreaming in the sense of possibility, of imagining what could be. And when I get lost in a week full of emailing and copy editing a latest, my latest manuscript and sort of traveling between airports and I, I feel very micro in my work, is there a tool, a tip or exercise, anything you do to zoom back out when you find yourself getting stuck in the weeds? But it's, it's usually just exposure to um, um, other people who are in a different place from you and who uh, you know, may have something exciting to offer. You know, the, the best ideas click into place when, when um, you know, three or four things from unexpectedly different directions arrive at the same time. And then, boom, there's this sort of beautiful aha moment. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's about take a risk, go and get exposed mm-hmm. to um, people in other fields, um, Nature as well, I think, plays a role. Just just the sort of immersion in nature. I, I find that's very, I don't know, it sort of primes the pump somehow. I remember reading a quote by Bill Gates when I was a little kid. So he was probably, you know, this is probably pre-Windows 95. And he said, I always buy a different magazine from the magazine rack that I haven't read hmm. because I've already, I, then it's, I, I learned about a topic I know nothing about. I'll buy like the magazine about telescopes, the magazine about gardening. And it was just such a mind-opening thing for me because I'm like, I was just sticking to like Mad Magazine and National Geographic, maybe, or whatever it was. <laughs> and I was like, then I started thinking, I'll just go buy a different magazine. This is, of course, pre-internet, right? right? But, right. but you're saying, right. go to the opera if you haven't been. Go you know, take your kids to a place you haven't been. I love that. And we started this conversation today about attention. So maybe we can close with attention. We started about having attention to read mm. books mm. and having the time and space to read. Um, we live in a world where attention is quickly becoming, if not already, the most valuable commodity, right? Um, you know, um, and, and we feel in many ways that we're losing our ability to control what we're focusing on. Mm. You saw my cell phones in black and white because I'm so addicted to it. I turned my phone into black and white. I'm losing my own attention <laughs> on my own stuff. What do you, in your viewpoint, in your vantage point, you know, as I, I called it, leading the most prolific kind of thought leadership collective, I know you're more humble than that, but this is a huge thought leadership collective in the world. What do you find that captures your attention? How do we control what we pay attention to? Um, and how how can we be more conscious of, of, of our attention? Can you give us some closing wisdom or thoughts as we wrap things up today? It's a mystery, actually. Like, I don't know what... It, it's very hard in advance to predict what will cause a particular spark. Um, I think the best we can do is to apply some discipline to being open to different things. It's like, don't click on the easy stuff, click on the more thoughtful stuff. Um have the slightly more uncomfortable conversations challenge yourself um it's those it's those things that in aggregate may lead to um something special happening like that and and the good i mean the good news is that when <laughs> it's not all sort of miserable work <laughs> when 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 you suddenly see you know wow that might be interesting if you have a curious mind and you can go where your curiosity takes you, quickly that quest can actually become deeply, profoundly sort of ple- pleasurable. But you have to give it a chance to get started. And I, I think everyone's a little bit different. And, you know, the way in which it gets started, the way in which you find that moment that will pull you into a flow experience of, you know, exploring something wondrous, Um it, it's probably different in every case, but don't give up. It's there, you know, make time for it because if it happens, it's it's so worthwhile. Exploration, uh, wonder, exposing yourself to different things. Chris Anderson, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. It's been a delight. Thank you. Hey, 
Hey everybody, it is just me, it is just Neil again. I said your brain was gonna hurt, and I don't know if yours does as much as mine, but I'm still, I mean, this was weeks ago now that I talked to Chris, and my head's still spinning as I listen to this. I'm like, man, there is a lot here. And he says it all, is it just me? He says it all in this like really soft, gentle, disarming way. And you don't quite get the full punch of it until you sort of think about it a little bit more and sort of stew over it for a few days. So there is a lot there. Um, how do we tackle the things that are ugly and imagine the things that are beautiful? Wise words from Chris Anderson, who encourages, uh, encourages us not to click on the easy stuff, but instead click on the more thoughtful stuff. Have those uncomfortable conversations that really push our minds forward. So where are we now? Where are we in the top 1,000? Well, this is a 14-year quest, right? We are trying to talk to 333 of the most inspiring people in the world and ask them each for their three most formative books. Chris just gave us number 969 on our list, Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker, number 968, The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch, and number 967, the Blue Sweater by the incredible Jacqueline Novogratz. Those three books continue our journey. So I will see you next week. Not next week. I will see you next lunar cycle, people. What am I talking about next week? I'll see you when, when the moon is, is full once again on the exact minute. Until next time, thank you so much for listening to Three Bucks. And now, if you've made it to this far in the podcast, I'd like to welcome you back into the end of the podcast club. This is one of two clubs that we have for three books. The other one is only available via secret password, but you've got to call our number 1-833-READ-A-LOT to kind of dig into it and find out more about what I'm talking about. That one I can't talk too much about, but this one is the end of the podcast club, and I will begin the way we always try to begin, which is by going to the phones. Give me a call at 1-833-READ-A-LOT anytime, and we might play your voicemail. So let's see who's calling us on this chapter. Hey, Neil. It's Heather calling from Ottawa. I am currently listening to you talk to Sarah Ramsey. It is awesome how uh, people can connect this way, and I can hear about your conversation with her, which I'm sure was a little while ago, and for me it's as new as can be, and I'm learning so much. Uh, one thing that really struck me is just how respectfully and with this wonder she is talking about the books, those three books that she's mentioned, uh, Currently, she's talking about Light Boxes by Shane Jones, and it got me wondering whether you inform the authors of the books who, that are discussed on your show, um, whether they know that their books are being talked about with such reverence and such, um, such honor. And I was thinking how amazing it would be for these authors to get to tune in and to hear their work being celebrated. So that's what I wanted to share, and uh, I hope you guys are doing well. Thank you, Heather from Ottawa. And it's amazing that you're from Ottawa because we're actually heading to Ottawa for the next chapter of three books. I'll just leave that as a little tease. Okay, we're going to go to Ottawa for the next chapter. Um, you know what? I'm so glad you called because you're right. Sarah Ramsey did talk about those books and those authors with such a beautiful reverence. And you're also right. Um, you picked up on the fact that no, we didn't even tell the authors that we that we talked about them. I guess in some cases it's difficult, like when a landmass die picks books by entirely dead people. But in this case, like with Chris Anderson, we can and we should and we will tell the authors about the books that we discussed. So thank you. I think we're going to start doing that. We'll start doing that on social media and see how that works, see if we get kind of good responses. But thank you so much for reminding us that we got to tell people when we talk about their books. Thank you so much, Heather. And now it's time for the word of the chapter. Uh, Chris Anderson is obviously a super articulate guy, so there's lots of good words to choose from. I was thinking about imperil or maybe strident, but I'm going to go with this one. Over to you, Chris. It's, not, it's meant to be like an Eastern. <laughs> there's a, a place of, um, of, of, of... So the room is called Jirga, which is the... the um, um, in Afghanistan, for example, which where I spend a lot of time... It's, that was the meeting where people come together when they want to resolve a dispute. Yes, it is. Jirga, J-I-R, 
GA. The definition, according to Miriam Webster, is a council of Afghan tribal leaders. Wikipedia expands a little bit more, saying it's a traditional assembly of leaders that make decisions by consensus, and according to the te- teachings of Pashtunwali, it predates modern-day written or fixed laws and is conducted to settle disputes among the Pashtun people, but also to a lesser extent among other nearby groups. Um, interesting. Jirga. Jirga. J-I-R-G. A. And now it's time for the review of the chapter. As you know, you can leave a review anywhere for three books uh, on iTunes, generally based on wherever you are around the world. And if we pick your review for the review of the chapter, we will mail you a signed book. So this chapter review comes from iTunes Australia, going down under from Adam Salias, A-S-A-L-I-A-S, Adam Salias. It says, a book lover's new best friend. Loving the show. I'm only six chapters in as I write this, so I'm looking forward to the next 327. Great idea. Great way to pick your next book. The Seth Godin episode is a clear standout. Uh, strongly recommend adding to your weekly listening. Good companion to another book podcast I love called What You Will Learn which also features Seth Godin. Okay, that's good to know. So there's another book podcast out there, thank you, Adam, that you recommended called What You Will Learn. We will have to check that one out. And we really appreciate you sending in the review of the chapter. And so as I close off this chapter, I just thought I'd close with one of the quotes that Chris said. Uh, Let me see if I can pull it up here. There was a lot of kind of gems. 